I'd like to give just uh, one more word of the Together at Christmas. Thanks to Children's Ministries working late last night, we were able to get the magazines printed off. Our big ask for Together at Christmas is that we have families that are worshiping together. Uh, we just understand the value of families being together, of children watching their parents as they worship. Uh, there's something so powerful about just watching mom and dad worship Jesus together, and then having opportunities to be able to have conversations, leaving, uh, and, and knowing as parents that God has spoken into our hearts, and being able to share that with the kids, and then to receive back from them. It's just something that can tie us uh, closer together as families, and so that is our big ask, that families would choose one hour where they are worshiping together as a family, and if that's something that you want to commit to, we have magazines out in the back, and we also have a little ornaments for your Christmas tree, and it'll be a reminder this Advent season that we're worshiping together as a family. And in those magazines, we have activities. Uh, we have questions with the sermon. So if you want to know what God is doing in the lives of your kids, you can ask them some of those questions. You can also answer them yourself so that your kids know what God's doing in you. But there are all kinds of things in that magazine that's going to carry you through the Advent season. So if that's something that you want to commit to as a family, Take one of those magazines, take an ornament. Uh, we're asking just one per family, so we have enough to go around and uh, do that together this Advent season and enjoy that time as a family. So before we dive in tonight, will you pray with me one more time? Father, once again, we just thank you so much for giving your word to us. Um, we're so blessed to be able to study it, to uh, take it in, uh, but we know, Holy Spirit, that um, nothing's really going to happen unless you take those words and you begin working and digging inside our hearts, and so we ask that you would do that tonight as we receive these words, uh, that you would take with them and do as only you can do, uh, work within us to speak truth into us and transform us. Uh, so that we can live our lives uh, the way that you have intended for us to live. And I pray this in your name. Amen. We're going to be looking at uh, Luke chapter 4. We'll be looking at verses 16 through 30. So if you want to get a head start, you can turn there right now. <clears throat> I'd like to begin with a little bit of history, though. So it was March of 1865, and the end of the nation's bloodiest war was in sight. And Abraham Lincoln could easily be expected to mark his second term with triumph and a celebration of his, his side's righteousness. And as he emerged onto the inaugural platform, the sun made its first appearance after being hidden by the clouds for most of the morning. And light flooded down and shone on the Capitol Dome, which had not been completed when Lincoln had begun his first term in taking his oath of office. But the president knew in that moment that the country still faced huge challenges. And there was bound to be bitterness. There was bound to be animosity. And how in the world was he going to unite this nation and make it whole once again? It was one of the great challenges in American history. So instead of a vic victory speech, Lincoln delivered a brief address with a very different tone. I want you just to listen to his words for a moment. He says, With malice toward none and with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. You see, the message that many in our country expected to hear, and probably the message that most wanted to hear, was not the message that our country needed. And the same is going to be true of our passage today. So 
we'll be in Luke chapter 4. But before we start, I just want to give a little context into where we'll be reading. So before we begin with that, we're going to be reading about synagogues. And synagogue literally means a gathering place. It is a place of assembly. And these synagogues would be located in each town, some of them large, some of them small. Each would have a synagogue. And they were used for many purposes. They would hold court in these synagogues. They would hold formal schooling in the synagogues. It was a place of communal meals, a place where charity was collected and distributed, and it was also a place of worship. Now, just like today, as we come together and we worship, we have a style of worship, or maybe we have certain things that we like to do as we worship together. And the same would have been true in these Jewish synagogues, but typically they would begin with a reading of the Shema, and you may be uh, familiar with that. It begins with, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then after they would recite the Shema, there would be a reading from the Torah, or the first five books in our Old Testament. Then they may go to the writings, or as we have them, the Psalms. And then they'd make their way to one of the prophets, And after the reading of the prophet, there would be an interpretation of what the prophet was saying. And and then they would finish and close their service time together with a blessing, or as we like to call it, a benediction. So at the time of our text today, this is how their services would be conducted. And we're going to be specifically looking at Nazareth. Now Nazareth at that time was about two to three hundred people which is about the size of our junior high middle school ministry that we have here at the church. So it is not a very large town at this time. Now today it's about 70,000. But at the time that we're going to be reading, there was two to 300 people in this town. And I would imagine now that as they are heading into the synagogue on this particular Sabbath to hear the rabbi speak, that this synagogue would have been busting at its seams as someone that they know very well is coming to teach, someone that they have heard all about, and actually someone that many of them had actually grown up with. Some there had watched him grow up. His name is Jesus. And so some are come questioning, wondering what they're going to hear. Some are coming, wondering what they're going to see and what's going to be said. So let's take a look at that right now beginning with verse 16. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, as was custom, there would be a man who would hand the scroll to the rabbi that would be teaching on that day. And and as Jesus received the scroll, he opens to Isaiah. And so you can just imagine this scroll unraveling as they have the entire writings of Isaiah. And everyone there would have been so familiar with these writings, and probably many of them actually had them mem- memorized. And Jesus would have just scanned until he got to the point where he wanted to read, which we have as Isaiah 61. Can you put that up there for them so that they can see it? This is Isaiah 61 in our Bibles, and Jesus would have just scanned, and he would have gotten there, and then he would have read this. And they would have heard this many times. Some say that it would be custom that they would work their way through the entire scriptures and there would uh, be a continual pattern working their way through the Old Testament, the Torah, working their way through uh, the prophets. And so they would have heard this many times. And as the rabbi would have read this, he would have given his interpretation of it and they would have understand that this was an incredibly gracious scripture that was going to be read to them. And Isaiah would have been so different from many of the other prophets as they would have read them, and there would have been readings of doom and destruction. If you've read Jeremiah, you're familiar with his writings and lamentations. But you get to Isaiah, and you read something very different. 
This was a proclamation of the Messiah. So as they're listening and as they are maybe reciting this even in their minds, they are thinking to the time when the Messiah is going to come and the grace that will be bestowed upon them as Isaiah speaks of the year of the Lord's favor. What he's speaking about is the Jubilee, and you can find this in Leviticus. The Jubilee was the year of the Lord's favor. Now every seven years, the, the Israelites were supposed to not work their land. So six years they were allowed to work their land. They were allowed to harvest their crops just as six days out of the week they were allowed to work and harvest. But on the seventh day they were to rest. And on the seventh year they were supposed to give their land a rest where no work would be done to the land. And then after seven sevens, seven sabbatical years, this 50th year was the Jubilee year. And on this year, the year of the Lord's favor, all debts were to be canceled, and all land handed back over to its original owners, and all slaves were to be set free. This was a year of freedom, a year of grace. And as they are hearing these words, they understand the grace that is being spoken of. And I would imagine that in their hearts they are just saying, we cannot wait for that year to come. We have no historical or biblical uh, reference to the fact that the Israelites would have ever actually celebrated this. I mean, think about it. Could you imagine not working your land for an entire year? Can you imagine after what you have received, the land that you have received, the slaves that you may have, that you would then set everything free and let it go? They understood this grace, but they probably understood it even more now that they were under the authority of Rome. And now that they were the ones that were being oppressed. And they were actually oppressed to the point of being starved because their taxes were so high. This year was a year of grace, and they would have understood that. So let's continue reading together from Luke. Then Jesus rolled up the scroll in verse 20, and he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now all the Jews would have been wondering, yes, we know that this is about the Messiah, and we know that this year is going to be a wonderful year where we will know the grace of God and it will be manifested like never before. But who is the Messiah and when is he coming and when will this year be given to us? When will we fully understand the year of the Lord's favor? And Jesus says, it's here. It's now, and I am he. But Jesus continues, and he says, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Do hear in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time. And when the sky was shut for three and a half years, there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were as many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet none of them were cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. I imagine that there would probably be a few more questions as well. And I can kind of see happening in the heart's of the Israelites here, the Jews, what sometimes happens in my own heart. And there are times where I am so focused on Jesus, and I am so in love with Jesus, and then something happens in my life where I begin to question, God, are you really there? And God, are you real? And God, how can I know that you truly are who you say that you are? And we get a snapshot of that very mentality from the Jews in this passage. As they listen to the words of Jesus and they understand the grace that is being spoken and they marvel at these words. And just as instantly as they marvel at these words, then they question. And they say, is this not Joseph's son? 
Is this not the son of Joseph and Mary that we watched as he grew up, the one that ran along the streets and would fall every now and then and scrape up his knee? Is this not Joseph's son that we all grew up with and used to play with him in town? And they begin to question because what they had in view of the Messiah is not what they were expecting as he now stands before them saying, it's time and I'm the one. But I think there's something even more that is going on in this passage. Something even more than the Messiah just proclaiming his time. See, I see this as the inauguration of the Messiah. This is his speech that he is giving to his people. But Jesus does something in this moment that he is going to become notorious for in the years ahead. See, Jesus is going to take this time where people are literally fawning over him and they are throwing themselves at him and they are marveling at what he is saying. And then Jesus turns it. Jesus had this incredible ability to know the thoughts and the hearts of his listeners. And because he knew this, Jesus was not okay with people just liking him. And Jesus was not okay with people just deciding that they wanted to follow him, that they wanted to listen to him, that he was going to be their rabbi. See, none of this matters to Jesus if the truth is not spoken. If this truth of who he really is is not proclaimed to the hearts of the people, then it is all meaningless. And I believe that Jesus cares about this so much because about a year prior he faced this very thing. About a year prior to this, Jesus is in the desert. And if you're reading through Luke, you will see that it jumps from the desert straight to this moment. In actuality, there was probably a year that took place in between these two. And if you're reading through the other Gospels, you'll see Jesus' teaching and his miracles. And as we read through this, they already know who Jesus is, and they know what he's done, and they know that he speaks like no one has ever spoken before. So there's about a year in between this time. So let's go back a year to the moment where Jesus is in the desert and he meets up with Satan himself. And Satan says to him, hey Jesus, if you will worship me, I'll give you all of this. Jesus, all of this will be yours. You will rule and you will reign. And as Jesus rejects that, Satan then takes him up to the top of the temple and and he takes him to the highest spot where everybody can see him. And he says, hey, Jesus, I know that you really are the Son of God. But if you truly are, then why don't you throw yourself from this place? And we know that heaven's angels will come and they will rescue you. They will catch you before you even scrape your foot. Now, Jesus, think about that. Every single person that is here is going to see that. Every single person will see these angels come down and catch you and know that you truly are are the Son of God. You are the Messiah. Jesus, they will come after you. Jesus, they will be all yours if you will throw yourself from this place. Jesus was already offered that, and Jesus is going to be offered this throughout his entire ministry while he is here on this earth. I just imagine his disciples, as they're there with him, and as Jesus now turns to this story of Naaman and this story of the widow at Zarephath. And Jesus turns this moment that has given so much joy and so much excitement. And the disciples are watching as everyone is saying, this is our guy. This is the Messiah. And wouldn't you know it, he came from our hometown. And then Jesus twists it and he tells a story and takes the people back to some of the worst times in their history. And Jesus highlights the faith, not of the Jews, but of the Gentiles, the enemies of the Jews. I imagine the disciples just shaking their head. We'll read later on throughout the the Gospels that his disciples will actually pull him aside and rebuke him for doing this. When Jesus says something that the Pharisees don't like, his disciples will set him aside and say, Jesus, you shouldn't have said that. Did you know that the Pharisees were deeply offended when you said those words? 
Jesus, what are you doing? They're not going to want to follow you. They're not going to believe you. They're not going to trust you. You're working against yourself in doing these things. And here we have Jesus doing this very thing as people are coming to him and they're wanting to listen to him and they're throwing themselves at him. And Jesus now turns it because he knows their hearts and because he knows their minds. And Jesus knows that simply having followers means nothing if the hearts have not repented. Jesus will do this as he has hundreds of people gathered around him, and then Jesus speaks about he himself being the bread from heaven. And at that moment, everyone walks away. Jesus knows that unless hearts are repented, then it makes no matter if if they're following him or if they're not following him. It makes no difference. And so Jesus speaks to the very thing that is going to cause them to question whether or not they truly believe. And if you have truly believed the gospel message, then I'm sure that you have had that very moment in your life where the Holy Spirit has either convicted you or has spoken to you and has spoken to the one area in your life where unless you release that, there is no way that you are following the Lord. Jesus does this very thing with the rich young ruler. When he says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, sell everything and follow me. That's not actually a requirement. But Jesus knows that this is the very thing that is holding this young man back from truly giving his life and following and truly believing, coming to a point of repentance. And every single one of us has got to get to that point in our lives if we have not already where we can allow the Holy Spirit to pick that very thing out. And I am guessing that if you have been to that point in your life, you've not just experienced that one time. But I'm guessing this has been a regular occurrence in your life. And as the Lord works in one area of your life and and as he begins to bring healing or wholeness to this area or begins to set you free in this one area of your life, he continues to dig and he continues to work and he continues to find the thing that is holding you back from him. And he does that with the people in the temple. And many of them struggle with this. struggle so badly that they actually reject him. Will you read with me? All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up and they drove him out of the town. And they took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Now, typically what would happen here is they would take a person that they're getting ready to stone. This hill is about a half mile away from where this synagogue is located. So the people were so furious that they were willing to drag him that far because they wanted to get rid of him. So most likely what is going to happen here is their intention is to throw him from this cliff where they can then begin to pick up rocks and begin to stone Jesus. They're ready to kill him. They are so furious with him because Jesus has not only attacked this area of their life, Jesus has gone so deeply that he has even said, this message isn't just for you, it's much greater than what you think. This message is for all people. This message is even for the Gentiles. Jesus actually stops in his readings in Isaiah, and he ends with the year of the Lord's favor. What is right after that is it says, the vengeance of our Lord, the year of our Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our Lord. And Jesus stops before he even gets to that point. Now, vengeance would have excited the Jews at this moment. They would have been saying, yes, our enemies. We're going to rule over them. We're going to reign over them. We're going to take authority over them. We are going to do to them what they have done to us and much worse because the Lord is on our side and the Lord is against them. And Jesus stops short of vengeance and ends with grace. And my friends, we are still living in this day of grace. 
And the Lord has been convicting my heart that my message and my actions and my attitude and even my love has got to change. And I have, be, have to begin walking in this grace rather than this judgmental attitude where I want to bring about the Lord's vengeance on people because right now is the time where the Lord has opened everything up and he has said this is a year of grace. This is the time of the Lord's favor and all are welcome. And we have got to be doing everything that we can as we leave this place to bring people into this time of the Lord's favor because it is a year of his grace and this is something that he freely gives to anyone who would choose to believe. And he calls us to be a part of that with him. So my question today is this. Jesus was not afraid to be rejected because he loved so deeply that he was willing to take on rejection if the truth and the grace of God would truly be preached. Now, for truth to be received, there has to be a repentant heart. The gospel message cannot be received unless a heart is repentant. My question is, are we willing to be rejected just as Jesus is? Because as I was reading this, I realized this is my thing. Am I willing for people to turn on me? Am I willing to be rejected just as Jesus was willing to be rejected because he loves so deeply? Am I willing for people to walk away, even maybe from my friendship, not because I'm coming with a judgmental attitude, but because I am coming with this scandalously offensive message of grace that does not make sense to people who want to earn their own righteousness and their own favor with God? Am I willing to be rejected for the sake of that gospel? Are you willing to be rejected just as Jesus was for the sake of the gospel. I think this is what Jesus is preaching in this passage. Yes, he's declaring that he is the Messiah, but he is declaring that this is the year of the Lord's favor. And it is open to all who would choose to believe. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we ask that you would work so deeply in our hearts, even convicting, because, Jesus, we know that you love us, because, Jesus, we know that this should be the effect of the gospel message and the Holy Spirit in our lives, that conviction takes place. We ask that you would work in that way so that we can live out this grace, that we can live out this love, that we can do it in this place towards one another, but Jesus, that we can do this all the more to those outside of this building, to those that have not yet come to know you, Jesus, that may be family members, that may be complete strangers, Jesus, that may even be people within these walls that we interact with on a regular basis. Jesus, we ask that you would open up our eyes, that you would open up our hearts, that we too can preach this message of forgiveness. We ask this in your name. Amen.